Hello, this is Doug Gerlach, founder and editor-in-chief of the Small Cap Informer Stock Investing Newsletter. Welcome to our mid-year 2021 subscriber webinar. We're going to take a look at the progress that small company stocks have made year to date. We're going to talk about the performance of the picks in the newsletter, and we'll discuss some other topics relating to what's going on in the economy and the market and how you can position yourself uh, to ensure that your portfolio continues to perform as you expect. Uh, it is June 30th, 2021. Hard to believe that we're halfway through this 2021 year. We thought uh, we might never get to this point. So it's a momentous year for small company stocks and the stock market in general, and uh, as well as the economy. But there are still lingering questions, and we'll do our best to address some of those as we discuss uh, the topics in today's presentation. But let's start by talking about what's going on in the small cap and broader stock market so far in 2021. Here's a graph of the year-to-date performance of the small cap, large cap, and international uh, indexes. Uh, the S&P small cap 600 is the winner year-to-date, up more than 22% for the year. That's a phenomenal uh, performance uh, that started back in October. Uh, the S&P 500 up 14%, and that's still a great a great year uh, for the S&P 500 and the EFA, the Europe Australasia Far East Index, trailing behind at 8.9%, um, as it has been for much of the last uh, half decade or longer. The uh, this outperformance is kind of uh, unusual for small company stocks. We don't often see it, especially in the last uh, in the last decade. Uh, but as I mentioned, it started back in October, and it's not uncommon when we're coming out of a bear market. Uh, we see large company stocks, the the Nasdaq, the S and P 500, reaching record highs in. 2021, but still small company stocks are leading the way. As I mentioned, back in October, uh, as uh, things kind of reorganized themselves in the market, small caps started to lead large caps, uh, and that's continued through March. And then from April uh, until today in June, small caps and large caps have been performing pretty much in line with each other. Uh, but we've still got that, that head start that small company stocks uh, took out of the gate as the year began. When you look back at the last 20 years uh, at the Russell 2000 index, it outperformed the S&P 500 in 14 of 21 years, uh, and rarely since 2015 have large caps, uh, have uh, have small caps beaten large caps. So uh, when the small caps take the lead, uh, that's when they they make up for lost ground and will see some uh, better performance that will lead them over the longer term to uh, outperform the, the broader markets. Uh, when we look at what's driving the market right now, the certainly the uh, uh, massive 20 year shift towards indexing and ETFs that's really take, took off after the 1990s bull market continues to support equities and equity investing and a lot of uh, capital still going into uh, the, the market via those vehicles and that's supporting stock prices and keeping them, uh, keeping them uh, elevated in the midterm, uh, the, there is no alternative. The TINA effect is still in place. When you look at treasury bonds, you look at CDs, you look at bank savings accounts, there is really not a lot of alternative for investors seeking any sort of meaningful return. And so that, again, shores up equity prices uh, and helps uh, keep capital in the market, and that will help uh, keep elevation or valuations elevated as they are. Uh, when you look at the PE ratios of the last three to five years, uh, for many companies, it's much, they are much higher per unit of uh, earnings growth than uh, they have been in any other period uh, in the last 10, 20 years. In the short term, there is optimism about the economic recovery. Um, there are certainly fewer large cap opportunities uh, at the end of 2020. Uh, the, uh, the rebound in the broader market uh, pushed a lot of large caps back up to full or extended valuations. And so I think that created opportunities at the end of last year for smaller company stocks. So uh, if you can't find, if you're stuck in stocks, so to speak, and you can't find bargains in the large cap market, then you start looking for some of the undervalued opportunities in the smaller uh, company space. And I think that's what we're seeing as well, and that's supporting uh, the the uh, uh, the big boost in small caps in 20. 
21. But if we go back looking at the history of the market starting in 2006, uh, just a, a kind of a, uh, a date at which there are there's index available, index data available for small cap, large cap, and international stocks that we can compare. You still see that small company stocks come out ahead. There are periods, uh, for instance, from 2006 to 2009 on this graph, where small caps and large caps pretty much performed in line with each other. And then following the 2008 bull mar bear market, uh, small caps took out and led the way. Uh, and uh, uh, they led the way through the decline of 2020 as well, uh, but have rebounded nicely and still lead over the long term, which is, of course, our objective to outperform markets over the long term uh, with smaller company picks that will help boost your overall returns. So how is the newsletter done? Well, let's take a look at the update and an update of the performance uh, in the uh, year ending December 31st, uh, our, and uh, the three-year and the five-year periods, um, the small cap and former picks on in aggregate have outperformed the S&P small cap 600, which is our benchmark index. And our lifetime results were more than doubling the performance of the index. Uh, so since the newsletter was started in 2012, uh, we've done uh, very well in relative to that small cap index. So we're very pleased with that record. Year to date, the compound annual return with dividends through June 25th, last Friday, is 45.7% for the small cap and former picks. Uh, and for the one year period ending June 25th, uh, the small cap and former picks are up 60.59%. So again, very strong performance. We love to see that. Uh, and we think that that's a, a really good indication of the, the types of returns that we're hoping to gain. And of course, not every year, not every period, uh, but we are pleased with our, our performance in uh, in general, uh, I will point out that even though the, the indexes have seen some negative uh, performance uh, in the small cap space, um, we've actually managed to maintain a positive return during those periods. So again, I think that speaks to our quality and reasonable valuation approach to investing that helps support our performance. Now, just some notes, our objective is to outperform the S&P small cap 600, uh, which I think better represent small caps in general than the Russell 2000. Uh, the Russell 2000 are the 2000 smallest companies in the Russell 3000. Uh, and so some of those uh, companies in the Russell 2000 are uh, large uh, mid or even large cap stocks, uh, whereas the small cap 600 really represents the smaller company segment. Uh, we acknowledge we're not going to beat the overall market. We're not going to necessarily beat the S&P 500 uh, on a year to, uh, on a regular basis or for any specific period. We're not going to beat the Wiltshire 5000, but we do believe that investors need to focus on including some small companies in a well-diversified portfolio so you can capture the outperformance that comes when the market shifts out of favor from large caps to small and then back uh, as it does. And uh, for, for us, this uh, diversification strategy really helps optimize the risk and return in your broader portfolio of equities. Uh, so we, we remain committed to that concept uh, and uh, do want to emphasize our objective is not to beat the market, but to beat the small cap market with our picks. So feel free to type in your questions using the questions box in the GoToWebinar application, and I'll do my best to address those as we go. Uh, I did also, since we're taking stock of our portfolio performance, I uh, wanted to take a look at some of our all-time best and worst picks because we have made some mistakes along the way uh, and we're constantly trying to tweak our, the methodology to improve the performance uh, and how we deal with underperforming companies that are in the coverage list. Uh, the newsletter, as I pointed out, was founded in August 2012. So since then, we have published 108 issues, which is pretty incredible each month, each with two stocks in each of those. We follow the better investing principles of stock selection. Better Investing is the nonprofit investor education group, uh, and they are the parent company of our publisher. Uh, and we do uh, adhere to their principles and use their methodology with some modifications to address the concerns that investors have when they're looking at smaller company stocks. But our audience of investment club members and individual investors always is looking for good, small company 
opportunities, but they're harder to find. And so the newsletter was created in order to serve that particular need. Now we we might, you'll hear me mention the portfolio of stocks. This is not a managed portfolio that we're providing, but we really are a research service, hoping to identify opportunities that investors can pick and choose from that fit into their own portfolio, matching the diversification needs by industry and sector, as well as company size. So hoping to find those small company stocks that will fit into each investor's portfolio and the investors get to figure, figure out which stocks fit best with their particular approach. So that's how the newsletter is designed to work. We currently have 88 active recommendations of 49 companies. In other words, there are 49 stocks that we're following right now, uh, and some of them we have recommended once, twice, three, or even four times uh, in the last uh, nine years. So there are 88 active recommendations. Of the current holdings, the best current stocks, uh, the uh, Skyworks is our best. We started covering it in 2013. It's up 551.8%. LGI Homes has done very well since 2016. So in five years, 385% uh, return and five below, not far behind it, uh, since coverage since 2017, up 500, uh, 352%. Those are the three best performers in our current list. The worst current performers are Kirkland Lake Gold, which we started covering last October, October 2020. Uh, it's down about 20.5%, uh, and we're fine with that. It's a defensive pick. The Kirkland Lake Gold is a gold mining stock, uh, and we were concerned that if the market and the economy continue to suffer uh, from the, the effects of the pandemic, that investors would be looking to hedge not only with gold, but gold mining stocks. And I still believe it's a good defensive place to be. Uh, and if you are at all concerned about where the economy might be headed, uh, when the pandemic might uh, resolve or return, then having a gold mining stock like Kirkland Lake Gold or Franco Nevada, I think is a good option uh, and something that you might want to think about. So I'm not concerned that it's down 20%. Education, uh, Educational Development is a publisher that we started covering earlier this year. It's down about 22% uh, since that point. Uh, unfortunate, but we'll talk about that company a little bit later. There was a, a question about it from Neil, I see, and we will, I will address that particular company. Again, it's not uncommon. We're trying to find undervalued opportunities. Sometimes these are stocks that are getting beat up by Wall Street uh, and uh, we're not trying to get in at the absolute bottom. So sometimes uh, it does happen uh, in the months following a recommendation where we see a little more volatility. We see some the prices declining a little bit uh, before hopefully then taking off and uh, showing some returns for shareholders. So those are the best and the worst. Uh, and out of our closed recommendations, we have 102 other companies that we've discontinued coverage for, uh, and those were recommended 128 times. So a couple of them recommended more than once. Now, out of those 128 recommendations, um, uh, and the, the math is a little wonky there, I know. Uh, 69 were closed at a loss, and 60 were closed at a gain. And we will discontinue coverage for a number of reasons. Some were companies that were bought out. So that's a, a forced uh, a forced exit from that particular company, uh, but that often indicates uh, you're getting, uh, you're exiting at a, at a profit. Uh, some were victims of the pandemic or the energy industry slump, for instance. Um, and so uh, we exited uh, a lot of companies. We kind of had a defensive shift uh, last year in 2020, following the pandemic, where we looked at some companies and said the the long term picture for some of these stocks is very optimistic, but in the midterm, we just don't know where things are going. We don't want to wait around uh, a year, 18 months, two years, three years to see what might happen. We think there are better opportunities to put that capital to use. So we exited out of an abundance of caution from, from a number of positions. Some of those companies came back a little bit. Um, and other times, uh, another reason we might close a position is because uh, of uh, that we perceive the stock to be overvalued at its current price. 
Sometimes that ends up being uh, a mistake um, because uh, the stock continues to climb, uh, but we try to stick to our discipline. And I've talked about using trailing stop loss orders, which is a, a strategy that you could use for those overvalued stocks uh, because it, it's frustrating. Uh, the math says the stock shouldn't go up in price uh, much more than it is right now. And then it continues to go up um, and you've sold it. Uh, because you were concerned about valuation. So that becomes a very tricky kind of situation. Something that we're looking at, uh, can we have a uh, set some stops or suggest some stops for some of those particular companies? But when you look at all of those closed, pos closed positions, the average proceeds from all of them with dividends is a gain of 9.3%. So, you know, uh, the, the net the net effect of the closed positions is a bit of a profit. The best performer of the closed positions is Sintel, uh, which we recommended a couple of times uh, the, from the initial re recommendation. It was up 216.9%. Uh, the worst was Amira Nature Foods, which we held on to for way too long um, and uh, learned some hard lessons the hard way. Uh, it was down 77% uh, by the time we, we closed that position. So uh, all in all, I think that's pretty pretty good. Uh, we have a, a slightly worse ratio than Better Investing suggests uh, that, that uh, if uh, that uh, four out of five times, four out of five stocks you buy should work out as well or better than you expect. Um, and so we're uh, we're not quite uh, at that level. We have many more closed recommendations, but again not concerned about it we are in a more volatile segment of the market the small cap segment so uh doesn't doesn't concern me uh as long as we can exit uh sensibly and profitably in most cases and still support a rate of return that will satisfy our objectives then we're in the clear so that's where we stand with that um Furthermore, we can do a deeper dive into the securities that were sold and compare the closed positions to the performance of the stock and the broader market since that recommendation. So of the 65% of the stocks that we discontinued have uh, failed to uh, keep up with the S&P 500 index since we we uh, discontinued them. So in other words, uh, those appear to be good uh, good exits, uh, that those stocks did not have a lot of uh, forward uh, growth after we discontinued them. And as I mentioned, 2020 was a weird year uh, for many different reasons, but our defensive shift um, uh, and the market recovery, uh, that very short bear market took a lot of investors by surprise. And so uh, we uh, also, some of those companies performed better than would have been expected uh, from the depths of uh, 2020. Uh, and so that skewed results a little bit. But uh, the majority of the sell decisions made prior to 2020 look right. Uh, when you compare them to how the broader markets performed since then. Uh, and another hard lesson learned is that many of the worst performers with the very smallest companies under $10 a share. Uh, we've had a rule of thumb not to look at companies below $5 a share. Uh, and since then, uh, I've bumped that up to $10 a share. Uh, so it's very rare that we'd be considering stocks uh, under $10. They're underfollowed. And uh, there is just uh, little information, little analyst coverage, little uh, guidance for those companies. So uh, that's, again, another lesson learned that, that I think is helping us uh, in the future. So another question uh, that came in that I wanted to talk about was how to interpret quarterly results. You've probably been in the situation where uh, a company that you own has reported quarterly or fiscal year results and you read the press release and everything seems to be terrific, the numbers are positive, and you look at the stock price and it's down or it's flat uh, and you're going, what's going on? Why is this stock not performing when the fundamentals are performing? Uh, and so there are some there are general there are often some good reasons for it that you might not be aware of. And so I wanted to kind of review some of those uh, situations and talk a little more specifically about some other companies. Uh, in the thing to keep in mind is in the long term, there's a very strong correlation between revenue and earnings growth and price growth. 
All right. So uh, when we look at uh, the long term picture, companies that grow their revenues and earnings, we'll see their prices go up. In the short term, there is a very weak correlation between revenues and earnings growth and prices. Uh, prices will go up and down for a lot of different factors relating to uh, uh investor sentiment, technical analysis, um, uh, analyst expectations, upgrades and downgrades. Uh, there are all sorts of factors that impact a stock's price in the near term. So really it becomes a guessing game uh, where investors and analysts in the short term are trying to figure out what is a stock's price going to do based on everything that's known about the company and all the speculation that goes into how the company might perform in the near term. This is why analysts make quarterly earnings estimates uh, and very few of them predict much past two years. Uh, hardly any analysts are looking at the long-term performance of companies um, in terms of revenue and earnings growth. It's all based on short-term indicators. So when a company reports positive results, you, you would expect the price to go up, right? That makes sense. Company's doing well, earnings are positive, revenues are positive, but sometimes in that same press release, the company will offer guidance for the rest of the fiscal year for the next quarter. If that guidance is negative or reduced or not what investors might expect, then uh, the, um, uh, the price might not go up, it might go down. Uh, it might be, and this is very common, where company reports positive results, but they were below analyst expectations or they were below company guidance. And so there was an expectation that performance would be better. And so now there's a concern they missed their estimates and there might be some more fundamental problems along the way. And so the price declines. Uh, sometimes a company reports positive results and there's a lot of selling action uh, because investors who are uh, holding the stock are taking advantage of the good news, uh, the uptrend in price uh, to take profits. And when a lot of them start to, to do it, that pushes the share price down. So again, it's specific to particular investors and their expectations that this is a good time to exit because we're exiting uh, at a profitable place. Sometimes the price doesn't change. Um, it, often companies will pre-announce preliminary results where they are uh, uh, guiding the market to what their actual earnings announcement will be. Uh, they might not include earnings and revenues. They might include one or the other. Um, and they couch this in language that these are preliminary results. Um, sometimes this will be because the uh, the results are not as positive as the company hoped or as analysts hoped. So the company hopes that by pre-announcing the results, they're going to soften the blow when the actual earnings come out. Uh, in those cases, uh, that pre-announcement may trigger the price to go up or down. And so the price isn't going to change when the actual results come out because the market already knows and is priced in those preliminary results. Sometimes uh, there is a lot of optimism about a, a stock's performance. You have a lot of investors that are trying to guess which direction a company's fundamentals are heading, and they will bid up the price if they're very optimistic. If there's a lot of optimism about a company, the price will run up in anticipation of the results. And then when the results actually come in, uh, the, there's really no place to go uh, but down. And so you've got profit taking going on. You've got uh, investors um, who, who already had run up the price going, all right, uh, this is what we expected. Uh, now let's, let's move our capital somewhere else and we'll find another opportunity. And then finally, uh, maybe the price does go up because the results are much, much better uh, than expected. And so that can be another uh, another example of uh, how you, you might not expect it. But uh, there's no guarantee that any of these factors will happen in any of these, that any price change in any direction will happen given any of these particular uh, situations. Now, if a company reports negative or mixed results, we might expect the price to go down. But again, the market likes knowledge. Uh, and uh, when you have facts in, in a place, then uh, you can you can make decisions that are more realistic in many cases uh, than 
if you don't know the facts, if there's just speculation, if there are just estimates available. So if the company's not reporting positive results, the price uh, you would expect would go down. But sometimes uh, they say, yeah, here's what happened this quarter, but the rest of the year uh, we had a problem. So we had a big order uh, that we couldn't report this quarter. It goes into next quarter. And so now it looks like our, our whole year is gonna perform better. So the price would, would go up or would be unchanged because the guidance is positive for the rest of the year. Um, again, if analysts or in investors expected much worse results, even if the company reported mixed results or slightly negative results, the price might go up again or be unchanged. Uh, and again, going against what you would expect of a price decline. Uh, Often investors are, are behaving in anticipation of results. So if there's an expectation, uh, and this speaks to uh, a broad community of investors across many platforms and analysts uh, and the, the concept of whisper earnings, whisper estimates, where there is knowledge that is shared um, uh, privately, uh, not necessarily in violation of any kind of securities laws, but there will be an expectation that things are looking soft uh, because uh, maybe the company's key customer has already reported their earnings and that they reported their output was much uh, much reduced. And so now uh, the, uh, 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 and this might be the case, for instance, if Apple reports um, that shipments of a particular phone model were much lower than expected, Skyworks is a provider of parts to Apple and components. So the investors would go, well, if Apple is shipping less units than anticipated, that must mean Skyworks is gonna be shipping less units to Apple. And so we would expect Skyworks results to be affected even though they haven't reported. So, uh, right, so there are all sorts of factors that might inform this anticipation of poor results uh, that uh, is publicly known information. Um, and remember, the price will always go down if investors are exiting en masse uh, all at once. So if there, we see that negative or mixed results and uh, this is a surprise, then investors don't like that kind of negative surprise. We'll be exiting those positions. And then, of course, when the results are so much worse than expected, uh, then you'll see the price um, uh, price dropping uh, because uh, that is uh, a serious negative uh, when uh, you've got an expectation built in from guidance or analyst estimates and the company doesn't live up to it, then you're going to see that price really going down as you would expect for companies that uh, report negative or mixed results. So those are some of the, the scenarios that you need to look be on the lookout for. And keep in mind that you are not the only uh, investor in the market. There are technical analysts and chartists looking at momentum factors, uh, looking at factors other than fundamentals that don't even care if the company is profitable or not. Um, there are companies like Tesla, as Doug points out, uh, in, the, in the questions that have no earnings. So there's a lot of interpretation about what their sales figures might seem to indicate about the company performance. Uh, and so for many companies, uh, the, the fundamentals simply don't matter in the short term. Uh, smaller companies often fly under the radar. So uh, sometimes companies report, nothing happens. It's because they have a very low volume. They have very low interest in the those stocks. We're trying to take advantage of those companies in many cases by buying them when they are undervalued. As they get to be bigger, then we see the benefits as more and more people pay attention, that will boost the price uh, and uh, those situations will kind of go away. There will Finally, there will be many cases where the price goes up, goes down, uh, doesn't change when there's an apparent catalyst, uh, there's positive news, the market's ignoring it. We may never know with any sort of certainty. Um, we talked about uh, uh, other factors as well. Uh, educational development, the book publishing company, uh, has uh, uh, you know has seen its price uh, drop down since we started covering it earlier this year or late last year, uh, and uh, there's no fundamental reason for it. Uh, the progress has been positive. They did pre-announce some earnings and, and results uh, last week. Uh, revenues were a little soft, but earnings are super strong. 
uh, the number of sales reps are very good. And uh, the most uh, identifiable reason that the stock is not performing better is that it's very easy to classify that company as uh, benefiting from the pandemic. Uh, if you're chel selling children's books uh, through a network of sales agents, when you've got kids at home, out of school, uh, there's a big demand for activities. And so having the opportunity to purchase educational books or children's books that keep them occupied, uh, perhaps out of off the TV, they're already spending time on the computer at school every day. Uh, so a lot of parents uh, were taking advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and so there's a question that perhaps with the pandemic and the restrictions lifting and kids going back to school, that there won't be as high demand for uh, the, that company's uh, products. Again, that might be the case. I think that even with, um, uh, and have we built into our model of what we expect sales to be, uh, that we expect that kind of slowing of sales and earnings growth that they saw in 2020, but it's gonna taper off over the next five years and it's still gonna be a supportable uh, growth rate and a profitable business. But you know, again, that's our perspective on their operation and we're willing to look past 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024 and see how the company might scale over the next uh, half decade. Um, another uh, example, uh, uh, Calavo Growers, the avocado company. Again, no negative news. Um, they're still seeing pressures from um, uh, Mexico and the imports that come in. Uh, it's a commodity, so weather can impact it. Uh, tariffs can impact it. Uh, a lot of their product has to be grown in California or Mexico. Uh, and uh, after the shutdown, Mexico kind of ramped up production and uh, sent to the U.S. a lot of low-cost avocados great for avocado guacamole lovers, not so good for Calavo, which is trying to maintain pricing power um, when you've got a lot of product available at a, a shorter, a, a lower price. So again, that sort of factor won't be addressed by the company specifically, but if you look a little broader at the industry uh, and the trends, you can often figure out this is what's holding back investors a little bit from this particular company. So remember in the long term, Appreciation drives, is driven by results, capital appreciation. So short-term results, probably not as relevant if you can be patient. And if you are, uh, uh, can justify the, uh, the strength of the fundamentals to carry through any sort of near-term uncertainty, you're gonna be much better off in the long term. So feel free to use questions. I am monitoring the questions box as we go through. Uh, so feel free to type in those questions. Uh, uh, let me take a look. I think we've addressed uh, a bunch of those. We'll keep going as we, uh, as we go through the presentation. I uh, wanted to talk about what's new for small cap uh, informer subscribers. Uh, earlier this year, the company made a decision to cap the total number of subscribers to the newsletter at 1,500, uh, make it a little more exclusive, uh, make sure that when we are creating picks that subscribers have the opportunity to act on them uh, before the rest of the market discovers them because we are in a smaller segment of the market. Some of our stocks have a much lower volume uh, and uh, so wouldn't take too many subscribers to immediately start buying those stocks and see the prices jump up a little bit. So uh, the, the, uh, our intention is once we reach that limit, we'll create a waiting list for any subscribers who wish to be, uh, who wish to join after that point. Uh, and so for you as a current subscriber, all you need to do is keep renewing and you'll keep your place uh, in the newsletter. We won't give it up uh, as long as you're renewing your subscription. So that policy is currently in effect right now. Uh, earlier this year, we added on the Small Cap Informer website, a technical indicators report. And I wanted to talk about that very briefly. This is intended not as a replacement for fundamental analysis, but to give you another point of information, another point of view, if you're on the cusp of a buy to sell decision, if you're thinking, you know, should I buy right now? Or if you have any kinds of concerns, uh, you can consult the technicals to give you a sense of what the rest of the market uh, that is not looking at the fundamentals might be 
thinking about the stock's near-term perspective. So as fundamentalists, we're often attracted to low valuation companies. We love bargains. Often those companies have weakened technicals because uh, they, they uh, might have hit a speed bump in their growth trajectory. Uh, it might be a long wait to for the market to come back to those stocks. So that's the case for why you might consider looking at technicals. Uh, and so the report uh, is in the subscriber section. You can click on it. You can sort it by ticker company, any of the column headers, and I'll step through very quickly, kind of give you an overview about those particular uh, approach, uh, different indicators. And there are plenty of places on the internet where you can find a little bit more if you're looking for it. Um, Susan asked about extra space storage, which uh, is according to the MFI, the money flow indicator uh, now is in an oversold range. The other indicators still in indicate that it's in a buy range or in a positive range, uh, but the money flow indicator seems to point out that this might be um, a, a point at which the valuation is a little bit high. So again, in conjunction with your stock selection guide, where you're looking at the PE ratio, the relative value, the upside downside ratio, the projected total return. Um, it, you know, if you're thinking those are looking a little soft right now, and uh, then you see that it's oversold according to MFI, that might lead you to make a sell decision. Uh, there's a question about uh, uh, that came in about knowing when to sell, and that's a big topic that has to do with your specific approach, your specific holdings versus in a tax deferred or tax advantaged account versus a taxable account. There are lots built into it, uh, but all we can do is suggest where the fundamentals and now the technicals put a particular company. So this is, uh, again, might be one additional strike against a company that you're looking at, uh, thinking about holding it. Uh, the Very quickly, RSI and money MFI are the relative strength indicator and the money flow indicator. Relative strength looks at uh, the momentum uh, as measured by recent price changes. Uh, so it's really giving you a sense of uh, purely from a price perspective, whereas money flow uses price and volume, uh, volume measuring demand, if you will, of a stock. So the money flowing in, flowing out, uh, getting measured by the volume, the number of shares that are trading hands along with the price. Both of these are pretty broad. Uh, and so they're very straightforward. Uh, and uh, there are some people who, who really only look at these particular companies or will look at the, uh, the relative strength of the, an entire index or all of the companies in an index to give you a sense of the broader health of the particular market. But it's important to consider that market conditions can impact it. So a company might remain in that overbought or oversold uh, category for some time. If we're in a bear market or a bull market, those market conditions uh, can really impact those particular indicators. Uh, so if we are in a strong uptrend of the market, some stocks may sit in overbought condition um, uh, uh, for quite some time. Likewise, in a, an extended bear market, a lot of stocks are going to simply uh, uh, show up as being oversold because the market is oversold. The uh, price trend is often something you can look at as well. Um, so we're giving you the indicators here. If you look at these on a graph, uh, it can give you a better sense. So there are pricing uh, applications. We have one at stockcentral.com, another at equityresearchservice.com, which uses these same indicators. Uh, and uh, the advantage of looking at a price chart is you can see the price trend. So if the price is going down or is flat over the course of several weeks, and it's sitting in that overbought, oversold, uh, uh, range, uh, that's giving you something about the trend uh, and not so much at predicting a reversal, which are probably what these are better at. Uh, the simple moving averages really are indicators that give you support and resistance prices in many cases. The 50-day si simple moving average is more short-term short focus focused, while the 200-day is more long-term focused. And the way they work is a signal is triggered when a stock's price passes the moving average line, either the 50-day or the 200-day. 
Uh, so it's a buy when the stock moves above the line, it's a sell when the stock moves below the line. Uh, and when we talk about trend on our report, it's really not uh, an up or a down trend so much as a favorable or unfavorable trend. So stocks with a downtrend, if you will, are unfavorable. They're below the moving average line, either 50 or 200 day. So again, from my perspective, the 200 day is more long-term focused and is a little bit better suited to our particular approach. Um, and uh, that would be my suggestion there. So as I use, so as I suggested using these uh, is really designed for us to be a second opinion. Uh, it's very important that you understand them and that you're consistent in using them. You're not picking and choosing. Um, so if you're committed to using one or two of the uh, indicators, stick with those. Don't you know? Say, suggest uh, try to try to jump your way around. It's much better if you if you're disciplined in your approach uh, and confirm them using other tools and charting. Uh, so if you're waiting for a stock to show results, then sometimes reviewing the technicals can help you with that decision. So if you're sitting around going, where do I, how do I, should I, what's this company doing? It's been recommended, it's not moving, hasn't done anything in three months, four months, six months. Uh, the technicals can give you some insight that will help bring in what the rest of the market is thinking about that particular company. What's the perspective of the chartists and technicians and momentum investors? But if you're a patient investor, you can leave the technicals to others. This is not something that we're considering that is a must, but it's sort of an add-on to our evaluation. We're gonna be looking at more of this uh, as we go. Uh, for instance, um, we have a new homepage for subscribers uh, in development, and one of those would be, here are stocks that have most recently uh, tripped a trend. They've uh, hit a reversal, um, they've passed the line, uh, they're in, they've uh, breached the overbought or oversold limits. Uh, again, so if you're <clears throat> looking at some additional guidance, it's there. If you're not interested, you can stick to the fundamentals and they will work just fine. All right, so questions. Uh, Ruthie asks, where do you find the handout? The handout is in the GoToWebinar application, so it should be in your screen. Look for the Handouts tab, uh, and you can download the PDF there, and we will make it available on the Small Cap and former subscribers website. Uh, so you can download it after the presentation. It will be uploaded there. Uh, James uh, sa uh, asks, can I explain the difference between the trend and the signal? Yeah, and so uh, I think I touched on it. Uh, a, a signal is uh, just that. It's meant to signal a stock's reversal, uh, either from one way or another, or a stock's uh, confirming the trend, if you will. So when we talk about a stock moving across a moving average line, then we're seeing a stock that is uh, giving off a signal that means it's either bullish if it's crossing up through the line or bearish if it's crossing down through the line. So the trend, um, the way that we consider it, is the trend favorable or unfavorable? That's the way to look at it in terms of how it's implemented in our uh, report. Um, the signals are really, uh, this is when an action happened. The trend is here is the uh, where the stock sits right now relative to this indicator. Hopefully that helps. And we'll look at, uh, there's some help for the uh, technicals uh, on the page. There's a bunch of, so there's some help there that will give you a little extra guidance as you're going through them. So uh, with that, let's take a look at our top stocks uh, for 2021 special report that we published back in uh, January, 10 companies. Uh, we've done this for the last couple of years. Uh, uh, 10 companies that we picked out at the beginning of the year as the best opportunities for the coming year. It's a bonus for subscribers. Uh, and so as of the middle of the year, let's take a look at those 10 companies and see how they performed year to date. And so here they are, the green, the uh, farthest right column is the percentage change, which is green if it's positive, uh, red if it's negative, yellow if it's in the range. Uh, essentially, anything that will 
uh, is that is on track to uh, achieve 15% return in the year is green. Uh, and anything that is uh, below zero is red and anything uh, that's in that range between zero and uh, seven and a half or so is in yellow. Uh, so here are our uh, the group of companies and the prices as of Friday. Superior Group, I continue to be optimistic about this particular company. I think the valuation is uh, is just uh, way out, uh, way disconnected with the fundamentals, but it is a small, underfollowed company. It's undiscovered by uh, by the by Wall Street, and I think they're still uh, a, vi a very viable business with a lot of growth opportunities going forward. So. Price-wise, not much has happened this year. Uh, biggest winner, Metafast, continues to perform well in the personal services space. This is the coaching nutrition company, uh, so helping with wellness and personal fitness uh, for all sorts of people. That's performed very well. NV5 Global, uh, the construction and engineering company, down at the bottom of 32% year-to-date. Again, benefiting, we think, from uh, some pent-up demand for infrastructure repair and the prospect of further uh, infrastructure spending would help a company like NV5. A lot of their business is municipal governments uh, and big projects that are driven by government or municipal spending. So we think there, there's a lot of uh, demand for that company going forward. Uh, and then uh, 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 method electronics, electronic components, especially um, used in uh, vehicles and uh, electric vehicles, et cetera, uh, performing well. And McGrath Rent Corp also uh, performing quite well, California based provider of rental. Uh, equipment storage units uh, and uh, portable classrooms, portable buildings. Uh, and again, there is a mandate in California that you can look at that says they need uh, they need buildings for students. Uh, they're not going to be able to build those buildings fast enough. Uh, McGrath Rent Corp is just an obvious solution uh, to put up temporary space. Uh, so uh, when you look at the mandates and the demand and who's providing, uh, it, it's kind of a no-brainer that they were going to have a, a pretty good year uh, going forward. Uh, when we break them down, into three categories. Some of them are in the hold, uh, Method Electronics and McGrath Rent Corp, two of the best performers, pricey at present. Uh, I would consider them holds there on the right. In the middle, in the buy zone, Superior Group, NV5 Global, Metafast, and Essent Group, uh, I think are in the buy zone. Essent is the private mortgage insurance company. So took a big hit because there was concern that people were going to be defaulting on mortgages and that was going to cost Essent. Uh, they were very uh, very proactive during the pandemic, uh, making sure they had enough capital. Um, they're very conservatively invested and they've got a great underwriting uh, strategy uh, and everything is reinsured. So we think that investors really uh, bid them down excessively uh, and the fundamentals are still strong enough. Um, again, there's going to be some lag time before when we might see uh, might see those mortgage defaults uh, coming to bear. But on the other hand, where the housing market is going and demand for housing, it might be that a lot of uh, homeowners were able to get out of their mortgages by selling their houses or that the banks that are taking over those mortgages are going to be able to sell the homes without making claims to Essent. So those are positive, uh, positive, and I think those are good for careful buying. And then the other four stocks are defensive because, again, coming out of 2020, uh, you know, I have a belief that a lot of investors are not really, uh, not really um, um, uh, defensively positioned as well as they can. Uh, Kirkland Lake Gold and Franco Nevada, I think, are two gold mining companies that I think uh, will perform well. Ollie's is a uh, again. Um, a defensive play discount stores tend to perform well when the economy is not performing well. Uh, I think there's a lot of growth opportunity there. And Physicians Realty, the real estate investment trust for medical properties. Uh, so those are trailing. But again, if the economy or market reverses course, those kinds of companies, I think, will be holding up. Uh, so uh, we're not, uh, I don't feel at all uh, uncomfortable that those particular stocks aren't performing as well as some of the others. Uh, but that's the current outlook for where we are right now. 
Uh, so some final thoughts before we open it up for some further questions. Uh, where is the economy headed? Well, er earlier this year, even late last year, my outlook on the economy was that we wouldn't see a full recovery until 2021. Uh, the end of 2021 at the earliest perhaps not until 2022 i think when you look at the gdp and the estimates coming out of uh, uh, the fed uh, that is still primarily what's going on uh, there's been a lot of strong economic growth in the first half of 2021 but there and the real gdp growth of seven percent is still terrific the best in the u.s economy since 1984 but from where the depths of where we're coming from, 7% growth is not necessarily a good thing. Um, if you are drowning in 20 feet of water and you make it up 18 feet, you could still be drowning in two feet of water. Uh, and so I think we still are underwater uh, because of big segments of the economy uh, that uh, there, where there are still concerns about what a return to normal might look like the entertainment business the travel business um, the hotels you know uh, airlines are seeing big demand um, greater than expected uh, but you know i don't feel like we're out of the woods yet with respect to the pandemic uh, and uh, demand for uh, for for oil and gas continues at this high level uh, again uh, that we could see more price inflation and energy costs than were expected, and that would have a detrimental impact on broader economy. Inflation is not a concern for me. I think interest rates are going to remain low into 2022, pretty pretty straightforward. And even if they go up a little bit, the Fed the Fed kind of changes course. Uh, you know, I, it's going to happen at some point whether it's 2022, 2023. I don't think it really matters to us as long-term focused investors. Let's leave our companies to manage the impact of inflation uh, and interest rates on their business. Uh, and we can do the best we can to identify good companies there. Uh, labor and material costs. Here we have uh, some potential headwinds. The employment market, just crazy. Um, that uh, companies are unable to find workers. Again, they're, they're not unable to find workers. They're unable to find workers at the prices they wanna pay for those workers. And those are two different things. So, uh, and it takes some adjustment. If, uh, you know, fast food, uh, fast food operations are going to raise their wages. Uh, they've got to build in some price increases in what they're selling as well. And we're seeing that McDonald's has eliminated value menu options in many off much of their menu in favor of higher margin, more exclusive or premium priced uh, products. So again, trying to address that. Uh, the market uh, uh, and material costs as well. You know, everyone knows or is, is probably aware of how expensive lumber has been, has gotten. And again, that's a temporary situation uh, just driven by capacity more than anything else, uh, capacity and high demand. Uh, those costs are coming down and I would expect that to kind of continue, but it is a variable we have to keep in mind. Uh, on the home building market, home sales did soften in May, but prices are still at record highs. So, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, fewer homes were being bought, both new and uh, existing homes, but prices still are very high, which seems to indicate that the, the demand is not yet sated for uh, the housing stock that exists. And there's still opportunities, big opportunities, I think, uh, even at reduced demand. Uh, you know, it's not a binary. Uh, it's not sales, home sales are good versus home sales are bad. Uh, home sales could decline and still be at record, at, at nearly record highs, right? It's not like the, the market, the, the housing market uh, flips on a dime and, and goes from one direction to another direction. And that's how a lot of investors and pundits treat the, uh, the, the home building and other aspects of the economy. So if, if, uh, uh, we we see a retreat from the record high prices and demand for housing stock. It doesn't mean that demand is drying up. It doesn't mean that everyone who's bought a new house is uh, has got their new house. Uh, there still is uh, signs of plenty of demand. And I think uh, the two companies, the three companies that we follow 
in the home building market are all focused on the entry level home builder, not the luxury home builder. I think there's just a whole lot more opportunity there than buying stocks of the big home builders that are making multi million dollar houses. These are the houses for um, LGI homes and century communities that we're following. Are you know, these are. Uh, under $300,000 typically, uh, and Capco makes manufactured homes that, that retail for even less than that. Uh, so as people are looking to get out of the rental market into first-time homes, uh, that's still a big move that's happening. We're still seeing a migration, I think, out of urban areas into the suburbs. That's going to benefit those companies as well. Um, so someone asked, uh, let's look at the, oh yes, uh, Richard asked, are you still bullish on the smallest home builders? So yes, I think I am. Uh, LGI Homes has been one of our all-time best picks. And when we selected the stock, uh, they were being shorted like crazy. The bears were out in full, they got squeezed out and the company has just performed quite well. Century Communities has grown even faster, uh, which has put a hamper on their progress a little bit, their valuation, because they've become a little bit bigger, uh, one of the 10 or five biggest home builders in the US. Uh, and they were barely in the top 25 when we started covering them. Uh, so those companies have performed super well and I would expect that to continue continue uh, down the road. So those are some of the key aspects of the economy that I look at and where I think we're going. In the market, uh, yeah, everyone, nobody's expecting the bond market to recover. 10-year treasuries aren't going to get above 2%. I really don't, don't see that happening. Uh, and that's just going to keep people in stocks. Uh, volatility, uh, we had a good, uh, a low volatility year uh, the last half of 2020, but we're looking to see that likely increase. And this is very much the case during second years of bull markets. We see increased volatility, volatility returning. So I'd expect that to happen. Uh, valuations for large cap stocks remain high, and that's going to continue for some, for some time. Uh, we've got large segments of the economy still depressed earnings wise, and that's gonna drag down multiples. When we look at an enormous company like Disney, I think this is a great uh, example of a company whose business is gonna take, it's not gonna turn around in a year. And in fact, they're putting into place uh, policies and procedures and changing their business model, I think, to, uh, to compensate for the impact of fewer bodies through the doors, fewer people um, uh, traveling, fewer people in their theme parks, nobody going to the movies, or fewer people going to the movies. How can we move online? Um, a, there were a lot of investors who were excited about the streaming service that Disney was launching. But again, that's not going to compensate for the la lack of uh, lack of revenue and earnings coming from uh, the big parts of their business in the entertainment and the theme parks uh, and the travel industry. So again, big company. So it's going to have, um, uh, it's going to take some time for those types of companies to come around and that's going to keep valuations. Uh, it, it exacerbates the <clears throat> The excessive valuations when we look at the sector, but there, but when you take out the, the sort of troubled or distressed companies, that means that what's left really have super high valuations. Uh, value stocks, I think, are going to pick up. Cyclicals may benefit from uh, coming out of the uh, recession. Uh, economic recovery, infrastructure spending, I think, is going to help with those uh, stocks, as I mentioned. NV5 Global, I think, will be a beneficiary of that <clears throat> value. We've talked about. Uh, in my commentary, value versus growth, uh, and uh, how we've been looking at value opportunities more than high growth businesses going forward because we're so adverse to buying stocks at very high multiples. Uh, and so there's a lot of people thinking, well, maybe now's the time for these value companies, these uh, a lot of energy stocks uh, that have been neglected for some time to finally see a little bit of a pickup in the market. But for all of uh, the investing decisions that you make, I would urge you to stay the course, continue to focus on identifying quality companies at reasonable valuations. Um, and when we look at our stocks in our coverage list, I feel pretty confident we can justify the quality metrics of most of them, most of them, the consistency of growth, the strength of their margins relative to competitors um, that justify holding those companies, if not purchasing more of them. Keep your eye on the long term. 
but don't be afraid to take advantage of opportunities that Wall Street is ignoring. And, and I would also suggest considering the defensive bent of your equity holdings by uh, boosting those, especially if you're concerned about the near-term market uh, weakness or economic weakness in general here in the US. Uh, so let me take a couple of questions before we wrap it up. Um, Uh, Bobby says, should you look to see that both the 50-day and the 200-day are in the buy range? No, focus on one or the other. If you're a long-term, if your focus is really long-term, I think you can safely focus on the 200-day moving average and, and don't worry so much about the 50-day moving average. That's the key takeaway there. Uh, and as you look at the technicals report, you will see, sometimes you'll see all, all, the, all the indicators flashing red, right? that is not necessarily uh, the best situation. Uh, and likewise, you might see a situation where everything's flashing green. Again, might give you a little more sense. But I would, I would sh figure out what you wanna look at and focus on one over the other. And again, I'm not suggesting that every decision has to be informed by the technicals, but when you're on the cusp, I think uh, it's the second opinion that you might be looking at. Uh, Tracy asks if I have any wisdom about setting stop loss uh, percentages for companies in the sell range. Um, that is the age old question of you've got a stock, it's showing in the sell range, it is showing as overvalued, um, but our philosophy is hold through periods of overvaluation. Don't sell immediately because when a stock becomes overvalued, it means that it's very popular. And that popularity is not likely to fade in the, in the short term, but you do wanna have some protection in place. My rule of thumb was somewhere between three and seven, eight percent for a trailing stop loss order. <clears throat> That's a, a an order you place uh, on your stock, trailing stop losses when the stock goes up, uh, the the uh, uh, the percentage trails along. So if you set a 5% stop uh, and the stock goes up 10%, uh, the stop goes up 10% to that next level. Now, if the stock falls from that new high, more than 5%, your order gets executed. So it's kind of tricky. Um, and I'm working on some rules of thumb where we might provide some guidance on that. But my, you know, somewhere in that three, four, five percent range, six, seven, eight percent range. But ask yourself, how much would I be willing to give up uh, if there was a sudden reversal in this stock and the price fell five percent, eight percent? You know, a 10 percent trailing stop loss isn't going to help you in most cases. You, you'll know because uh, it's very uncommon for a stock to fall quite so much uh, in, a, in a single day. You're really trying to capture the opportunity. And again, if, it's different if you're in a taxable versus a non-taxable account. Um, you know, if, if, if you um, uh, use a trailing stop loss order in a tax advantaged account like an IRA, uh, and uh, it, uh, you can be very disciplined and say, well, okay, well, if it comes down 5%, I'm gonna sell. Uh, and then if it goes down another 5%, you could buy back in, uh, assuming the fundamentals look good, and there's no tax consequence. So the decision uh, changes up a little bit there. Uh, Tracy says uh, about Ollie, um, uh, the technicals page for Ollie says it moved into the cell three days ago. Yeah, that might be the case. Again, uh, we're not looking at the technicals to make our recommendations or decisions. Uh, and just because the stock goes up or down, um, it can be in a negative trend and still be going up, if you will, if you consider uh, a trend to be favorable or unfavorable with respect to a particular indicator. Right? So uh, there are all sorts of kind of variables there, and I don't want you to get hung up on them. Uh, but if you are concerned about short-term volatility or if you are looking for second opinions, then I think consulting some of the technicals can be a wise thing to do. Chris says, how would I expect small caps versus large caps to be affected when interest rates rise in 2023? And again, it's not a binary. It's not like rates are going to go up and they're all of a sudden going to go up two or three percent at a time. They're going to go up by quarter percent, half percent bumps scaled out over time. Uh, by and large, the companies that we follow are not 
loaded up with debt so that they're going to be so impacted by rising interest rates. Yes, there are a few of them that are a little more leveraged, um, but generally those are the companies that have demonstrated expertise on the management side to handle the debt load, to handle the leverage, to translate it into uh, profitability and to manage the cost of debt most effectively. So from my perspective, it's not gonna impact companies directly quite so severely. Again, focusing on quality helps you weed out companies where if rates start going up and they've got unsecured debt, uh, all of a sudden now their carrying costs are gonna go through the roof. And I don't think we're in any position with any of the companies we're following right now. And still, if you look at, <clears throat> at history, even if rates go to three, four, five percent for borrowing, five, six, seven percent, that's still relatively low given much of uh, much of the uh, the history of interest rates in the U.S. and the modern economy. So again, not not quite so concerned about that particular uh, particular aspect of it, uh, and we'll uh, deal with it. It'll it'll be. Uh, it'll, we're going to see that train coming from a long way off. So if we need to make adjustments, we will be able to, uh, to do that uh, when the time comes. Uh, Tim says, <clears throat> what are some of our key approaches to predicting earnings? How much do we rely on analysts? We certainly look at what analysts, uh, analysts uh, who follow a company might uh, be projecting for it. Um, it's just another input. Analyst estimates, guidance, historical trend, industry trends, you know, you put them all into a, a box, you study them, the components, you put them together, and you come up with your personal judgment. So those, uh, that element uh, doesn't, hasn't really changed over time. And there's a little bit of art to it as well as science. I just want to collect, we want to collect as much information as is known about the company. Um, we want to look at all of those factors and then it becomes pretty pretty straightforward. Often uh, when I teach this particular topic, set up a spreadsheet and say, here are all of the different elements. Look at the rate of return on retained earnings. Here's guidance. Here's the analyst estimates from uh, this source or that source. And you put them all together Together, and it's pretty clear where the range of consensus is, where most people who follow the company seem to think uh, the, the company is most likely to, uh, to, to be heading with respect to its revenues and earnings. Uh, and so that makes the, the task a little bit easier. And because we're not trying to, we're not, we're not trying to hit a bullseye with our growth expectations, our projections. We're really trying to get into the ballpark. Um, and that's enough for us to make profitable decisions now as we're going forward. All right, uh, final question Neil asks about um, uh, Icon Research uh, purchased a competitor. Um, so big, big purchase for them, uh, but it, this combined entity um, should be pretty positive. Uh, and yes, th there's a question, uh, one question is, now that they've bought this competitor, are they going to be too big to be a small company stock? That's another problem we have with size inflation. Uh, we buy small companies that are successful. They see their uh, revenues grow. Now they're not so small anymore. We haven't cut anyone off for being too big at this point. Uh, so I wouldn't expect that we would discontinue any company it's purely on the basis of size. And my rationale for that is for most of our subscribers, a small company is really any company that's smaller than the large caps they already own. So we've got some small, some mid cap stocks in there in the mix. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm fine with that, so I wouldn't eliminate them. I don't see, uh, I, I see the acquisition of PRA by, uh, by Icon to be pretty good, pretty positive, uh, and the company says it's gonna be accretive to earnings at a double digit rate uh, this year and uh, more than 20% next year. So I think that's a positive, that's a win-win. And uh, I think that's good for the particular company. And with that, we're gonna wrap it up, but if you have any further questions, Feel free to email me at gerlock at iclub.com and I will do my best to get back to you. Uh, this uh, webinar will be archived on the Small Cap Informer website uh, for subscribers only for the next 30 days. And then we will release it publicly on our YouTube channel uh, where others can uh, take it in. 
but we'll have the PDF handout there for you as well. So thanks again for turning out. Thank you so much for being subscribers. I look forward to your continued feedback. You can use the discussion boards on the website to provide uh, additional feedback and ask questions, and we'll do our best to address those. Thanks again, uh, and best wishes for the rest of 2021. Stay cool, stay healthy, and above all, stay financially uh, profitable with your stock portfolios.